There we go. Um, so we've seen a significant uh, increase um, in mental health symptoms uh, following uh, our initial uh, lockdowns in 2020. Um, what that looks like from person to person has obviously varied significantly. Um, what it looks like from uh, culture to culture, from um, uh, place to place is also varied significantly because COVID has a, a fairly, COVID has had a fairly significant uh, impact that differs from place to place as well. Um, so when the initial lockdowns occurred in uh, 2020, we saw a, a sudden spike in mental health symptomology um, reported by people. Um, we then saw a fairly significant decline um, immediately following uh, lockdown. Um, as you recall, at least in the United States and definitely in the South where I am, um, that initial lockdown or what's called lockdown um, at the time was uh, roughly a month. Uh, it may, be a, may have been longer where you are, um, but we see a trend where in the general population, a lot of that uh, mental health symptomology began to decrease um, as you know, uh, lockdown ended. Um, but even though we saw a pretty sharp decrease to go along with a relatively sharp increase, um, there were certain things that didn't decrease to the same degree as the rest of, it, of the mental health symptoms. And so uh, symptoms uh, like depression and certain mood symptoms were, si were significantly less likely um, to decrease um, uh, over time post-lockdown. Uh, post um, we also saw that uh, our vul uh, vulnerable populations uh, tended to display greater symptoms and less stable symptoms in the sense that their symptoms were less likely to, uh, to diminish over time. Um, and initially, um, as perhaps a slightly interesting point, we saw no initial changes with pre-existing mental health conditions, indicating that a person who had a mental health condition um, didn't increase in severity immediately. So that took some time because later research tells us that um, uh, increased complexity with uh, co-occurring or uh, comorbid disorders um, is a result of uh, uh, the stressor, uh, the added stressor of COVID. Um, and then the, uh, the meta-analysis that uh, I'm talking about here also found really large variability among the samples. And so what we really take from that when we look at the variety of samples that were used in that meta-analysis is essentially that it fundamentally matters who your sample is made up of in this case. Um, and so that takes us back to looking at who are the most vulnerable in our, uh, in our communities, which populations are gonna be most impacted when we talk about something like um, uh, an infection like COVID, um, who, uh, who would stand to have more consequences um, uh, from, uh, uh, you know, from being in harm, uh, more in harm's way in this uh, types of situations. And so we often would see, uh, we often see how the vulnerable populations and the samples that represent them showed greater variability in terms of the severity of mental health symptoms um, because they were many times facing, um, you know, greater stressors in comparison to uh, other um, other people in the general population that made up other samples that were used in those 65 samples. So those are some, and this is just general population right now. So we aren't even talking about uh, college student mental health. And I'm curious as you see this, what, um, you know, what is, uh, th does this sort of line up with the things that maybe you've seen either in your own life or in working with, uh, with your own clients, or have you seen things drastically different from this? Any thoughts? Okay, we'll just keep going and uh, come back to some of that later. Um, but we do wanna talk specifically about 
how COVID has impacted college students. And there's a um, significant reason why we want to look specifically um, at college students in these cases. Um, first uh, and foremost, college student sample isn't necessarily representative of the general population. And so looking at a sample made up explicitly of college students is valuable because there may be differences in that, popula in that, in that sample that would not be true for the general population. And as you'll see in just a minute, as we talk about what some of the uh, emerging literature says, that there are some differences um, among college students that have not existed in the general population as a whole. When we talk about college uh, students, we really talk about um, two, uh, two different uh, groups of college students. We have what are in, in, uh, in the higher education literature is often called traditional age students and then non-traditional age students. A traditional age student is um, your, uh, uh, what you think of when you think of, you know, the 18 year old who finishes high school, immediately goes into college, um, they live on campus, they do, um, you know, the, the standard sort of stereotypical things that are associated with going to college at the age of 18. Age of 18. Um, a non-traditional student, on the other hand, um, has a lot of other uh, a lot of a lot of other responsibilities in their life. They may be older. Um, they may have um, uh, a family already. Um, they may have professional obligations. Um, so they may uh, be more likely to be part time or shift in and out of you know when they're in school full time, when they're in school part time. Um, and when we talk about graduate students, and uh, uh, specifically. Um, Graduate students are almost all by definition non-traditional students because they have finished a college degree or now men for the most part in the workforce and also seeking um, uh, greater education. Um, so, but for, let's talk about them separately for just a second and why it's important to uh, uh, address them um, and understand how COVID has impacted them. So for traditional age college students, college is a point of develop, uh, is a developmental point and it's bookended by uh, new stressors that they've never experienced before. Um, along with this perceived expectation, quite often that they attain some level of self-sufficiency. Um, and so when you have somebody who successfully finishes high school, they move out of, uh, they move away from home. When we talk about a very traditional college student, um, they move away from home. They are now required to uh, live on their own, take care of themselves, go to college, um, successfully complete college only to then complete college and immediately enter the workforce. Um, that's a lot of stressors for a four to five year period for the vast majority of people. And so those stressors are always present um, for college, uh, for a traditional college student. Then we have to uh, evaluate and investigate what, is, what does it look like when we add the additional stressor of upending that entire process with something like COVID. Um, additionally, we are interested quite often in this area, uh, in this age range, because the age range of 18 to 25 is also the onset for many mental illnesses. Most severe mental illness is going to onset uh, in late adolescence and uh, up to age 25. And so um, if you think about the, uh, if you can recall from, uh, uh, you know, early psych classes, you probably come for something called the diathesis stress model. And uh, essentially what we, uh, uh, talk about when we mention that is that, you know, as you add stressors, the ability to manage those stressors successfully um, can not, fun, won't necessarily determine whether or not a person will have mental illness, though that can be true in some cases, um, but it will certainly um, speak to the level of severity that is represented in an individual um, in regarding to their ability to manage the additional stressors in their life. And so when we have a traditional age college student, we're already adding a bunch. Um, and then for uh, incoming freshmen in, 20, uh, in the 2019, 2020 year, or any college student who was in college at the time of um, uh, the initial point of uh, COVID, that would have been a significant uh, additional stressor on top of an already stressful time. For non-traditional age students, um, we have an understanding that they're shouldering academic responsibilities of their traditional student, uh, traditional students, um, but they are also doing lots of other things. So a non-traditional age or non-traditional student has 
all of the same academic responsibilities, but they have lots of other stuff too. And so I might, uh, you know, maybe I'm uh, in my thirties and I have two kids and I am um, trying to get a college degree and I'm consistently having to ping pong back and forth between being full-time and being part-time. So it's going to take me longer, which adds additional stress uh, because that extends the cost um, you know, of how long I'm going to have to pay for something. And so you take, you, know, you begin having to take into account additional stressors that exist for this um, group that don't, may not exist for other groups uh, or for the traditional group. Um, when we think about COVID and how COVID may have impacted this particular group, think about if uh, that non-traditional age student had children and then school shut down, but they still have to go to school too. Um, and the ability to, to manage the responsibilities associated with other people um, are there, whereas that may not exist for traditional age students. The point of saying all this is simply to say that both groups of students have unique stressors already um, that are just built into the experience of being, an, uh, of being a student in college. And then adding COVID on top of that um, could really throw a wrench or did really throw a wrench into um, uh, uh, how those stressors were uh, managed either effectively or un in ineffectively. Um, and we also know too, that when we look at college student populations, that non-traditional students, um, they make up the vast majority of colleges now. Um, traditional age students make up a very small majority depending on how you define traditional versus non-traditional student. Um, non-traditional students can make up up to 85% of a, a traditional institution. Um, but they also have difficulty accessing resources compared to traditional students. And that's generally because they are they spend less time on campus. They have, uh, and so forth, uh, therefore they have significantly less uh, means to access uh, resources that are available to them. So this is why it's important. We've already taken a very stressful situation um, and we're adding a new stressor to the situation. What we find, find in the emerging research on college students as we um, you know, gain some perspective and understanding on how COVID has had uh, an impact is that we have uh, some, similar react, uh, some similar results in the college student population that, simil uh, those, uh, some that are similar to the general population. Um, so things like mood disorders and depression uh, increased during the pandemic and they have remained more stable than other diagnoses. And so across the board, college students included, depression and mood issues are currently understood to be the number one increased uh, issue related to COVID. However, there is also some significant, there's some significant differences in the college student population overall. Um, in college students, we saw a stable increase in alcohol use disorder, uh, bulimia, binge eating disorder, uh, mental health comorbidity and externalization problems. Um, so let's talk about that last one for just a second. Uh, externalization of problems. And so things, uh, there are certain things within this list that represent the externalization of problems. So um, uh, the use of alcohol, externalizing a problem to, uh, you know, a, perhaps a negative outward solution, the use of alcohol to cope, um, the use of food to cope, um, uh, adding, uh, adding those on to it, those represent externalization of problems. Uh, there are many other ways that college students could have uh, externalized, uh, uh, externalized their problems and coped poorly. Um, but we also see an increase in mental health comorbidity, which, um, the, which research represented uh, and understood earlier than they understood, than we seem to have understood the increase in uh, the general population come more um, It tends to be more pronounced um, in college students than it was in the general population post COVID. Um, and that's because again, you're taking a group of people in a very um, stressful situation and you're adding a new uh, complicated stressor on top of it. Um, early research in uh, uh, on college students and COVID also suggests that um, uh, minority populations are more impacted. Alcohol use disorder was a uh, more prevalent uh, increase in women 
um, post COVID. Depression increase was more prominent in black students compared to white students and Latinx students reported significantly more distress during the general pandemic than, um, than any other group. And so um, as we often see um, with uh, situations like this, um, our more vulnerable populations are more impacted by, uh, uh, by additional stressors. Um, it's important that we understand why, um, and that why is generally going to be unique to the population. Um, and so uh, uh, there is uh, not yet uh, additional research on, you know, what is it that's unique to these uh, specific populations that could have caused, um, uh, you know, greater uh, difficulty. Um, but I, I'm certain that that is a direction as we close out and, uh, and gain an understanding of general, more uh, 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 assumptive populations that we'll start looking at more unique populations and how we can address the unique problems. So let's talk about coping for just a second, what it is and why it's relevant here. Um, so let's uh, just quickly define what coping is. Um, and coping is simply a behavior that's used in the face of a stressor that pushes an individual, um, or uh, that coping is used when a, a situation uh, pushes an individual past the point of manageability. And when we say manageability in that case, we mean, we might mean uh, really practical manageability, like things like time, the ability to manage the time that's associated um, with additional stressors. Um, perhaps we are talking about um, cognitive, cognitive manageability, emotional manageability. Um, it, it generally is unique among, uh, unique to the person. Um, and while the way an individual copes does not specifically uh, lead to mental illness, we do understand that the nature of how a person copes can aggravate or mediate the symptoms of mental illness. Um, I mentioned the diathesis stress model earlier. Um, and, you know, depending on what model you ascribe to in terms of how you perceive the origin of mental illness, um, one might believe that, you know, uh, an inability to manage stressors can lead to uh, mental health symptomology. Um, but regardless of what that, what your individual belief is on that, I do believe that we could uh, all agree on the fact that an inability to cope or using good coping mechanisms will help to either alleviate or aggravate um, the symptoms that are associated with mental illness. We look at, when you look at the literature surrounding coping, um, we see a lot of um, different ways of conceptualizing how people cope. Um, so we see a lot of dichotomies. Um, and I'm gonna talk for a second about why that's not necessarily good. Um, the idea that um, uh, approach, uh, we have approach and avoidance coping, uh, adaptive and maladaptive coping, or problem or emotion focused coping. Um, those are just three ways that we can, uh, the literature will sometimes describe the way people cope. Um, the idea here though, is that if I, I could take a, a coping behavior and label it as say, for example, an approach behavior versus an avoidance behavior. Um, the problem with uh, dichotomies like this is that they really uh, minimize the nuance of the individual. Um, that it can be very difficult to say that if, for example, um, one of the coping behaviors on a really common scale is the use of humor. Um, so the use of humor can, in, in my mind, in the way it's conceptualized and how, uh, and when we think about how an individual person might employ the use of humor to manage um, a stressor, I could see that being either good or bad. Um, it's not necessarily one or the other, that ultimately it comes down to the individual. Um, and so if you look at a lot of the literature, you will see it, uh, you'll see coping uh, conceptualized uh, dichotomously. Um, but you will also see emerging uh, more recent uh, research that says, well, no, 
maybe for research purposes, it's good for us to be able to say most of the time this thing is is um, adaptive and most of the time it's malad or most of the time it's maladaptive. But ultimately, what we have to do as clinicians is step back and say, okay, but I can't really say that the fact that you use humor to to manage stressors is negative or positive. Um, that it, it ultimately relies on who you are as a person in your individual situation. There are obviously certain things um, that um, would be very difficult to uh, quantify as uh, positive ways of coping um, and vice versa. Things that would be very difficult to quantify as negative ways of coping. But there are many more things that live somewhere in the middle um, that ultimately rely on the context of the individual. All that being said, um, the research that we do have indicates that college students are more likely to utilize things that generally fall into the avoidance category for coping or the emotional coping uh, uh, behaviors uh, type. Um, so we are generally, in, uh, when we talk about college students, um, we are generally saying that a college student is more likely to distance themselves from a stressor rather than approaching the stressor to manage it. Um, so initially, at least, distancing oneself from the stressor to avoid the stress rather than resolve, attempting to resolve the stressor um, to avoid the stress. Um, and they are also more likely to use emotional coping strategies um, rather than problem-focused emotion or problem-solving focused emotion, uh, 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 coping strategies. Um, so instead of you know, approaching uh, the stressor practically um, and looking for solutions, I'm, I may uh, experience anxiety and step away from it and use uh, alcohol to manage. Um, that would be a use of emotion uh, uh, that is both emotional, emotionally oriented and uh, avoid, avoidant in nature. That's important. Um, it's important for a couple of reasons. Um, it's important because it's good for us to understand what the general college population looks like in terms of the way they cope with stressors and if they're coping with new ones. Um, and it also, uh, we, can, we can really look at what we understand about that in terms of the general population, even pre-COVID, and look and see what post-COVID um, or um, current research is saying about the way college students are behaving in relation to new stressors. Um, So that the newer research has indicated um, that uh, cognitive, behavioral, and experiential avoidance are predictors of poor psychological well-being in college students. So, if if current if if sort of the emerging research around college student mental health says that avoiding things in college students avoiding things leads to poor psychological uh, well-being outcomes. And we also know uh, that students are more likely to avoid situations or use avoidance type uh, coping behaviors. What conclusion would that lead us to to begin with? Essentially that we really are gonna very, very, have to very closely watch um, our college students um, in uh, in this new environment because they are already, uh, in general, they have a tendency to use avoidant behaviors. Um, and we see post COVID that avoidant behaviors are associated with poorer outcomes. And so that's something that, that conclusion by itself um, has a lot of implications for how universities respond, how we might respond as clinicians. Um, and then, uh, you know, what that, and what that looks like policy-wise if you're a, at a large institution. Um, if you're a, a clinician, how that might influence um, the individual work that you might do with a person. Um, and one of the mitigating factors is that uh, participating in a campus-based wellness program, um, that people who, uh, who were involved in that had fewer mental, negative mental health effects immediately following COVID lockdown which also is an interesting point because it leads us to sort of a second um, uh, uh, conclusion that we can make um, regarding both uh, uh, resilience, um, how that affects coping and how that can uh, be influenced by environments, either us as clinicians or larger environments like university settings. 
So what kind of picture does this really paint for us? Uh, well, first and foremost, um, we know that college students are more likely to use avoidance strategies and they've been placed in an environment where avoidance um, may not uh, may be associated with maintaining physical health. So college students are more likely to use avoidance strategies to begin with. Also, at least at the beginning, um, that it was positive to, uh, to put yourself in an isolated state away from others. So not only do we know that they use avoidance strategies in general, um, many times they have to isolate um, or um, at least early on, there was really heavy isolation um, and that was, a, that was perceived as positive, but being able to do that um, is, a, is, a, is a positive thing because it will help uh, maintain your physical health because it reduces the chance of infection. Post-pandemic research has shown that we have an increase in mental health problems that are commonly associated with avoidance and emotion-focused coping strategies like alcohol use uh, disorders and depression. So we've told, uh, we have students who, who tend to avoid. They uh, have this now association with avoiding being uh, a positive thing or something with uh, potentially having a positive outcome. And then also knowing that the ultimate mental health outcomes of isolating and avoiding um, are, uh, are negative. Um, and then we also know that our, uh, our vulnerable populations, uh, women and students of color have been most impacted. And so they're more likely to see more severe um, uh, symptomology uh, as a result of all these things. So what kind of practical recommendations do we have here? Like I told you earlier, I worked for, I worked in student affairs uh, throughout grad school. I think all in all, I was in some kind of student affairs office for about 11 years. Um, and that goes all the way from student worker up to grad student and advisor. So I've seen a variety of different offices and the way offices respond to uh, student concerns. Um, and so I think it's important to understand how, how institutions respond in these kinds of situations uh, versus what perhaps would be a better way of responding in these kinds of situations. Um, institutions are gigantic. Um, they are, uh, uh, they certainly, in most cases, have the best of intentions, but it's very difficult to take such a gigantic institution and move it in a direction quickly. It's not, you know, a, a university is a turtle, it's not a rabbit, it's not, it doesn't move fast. And so, and there are lots of things that go into how um, a university changes policy and why a university changes policy. Um, and you would think that the well-being of students would be one of the primary motivators for the change in policy, um, but that isn't always the case. Um, and that has its own reasons. Um, you know, health of students uh, is many times something that occurs off campus. Um, it's not something that, even though there are oftentimes campus resources available to students, uh, many students are going to utilize resources off campus instead. If it occurs off campus, it, it generally has, there's no bearing on the institution. The institution is not aware of it. And so there's no intervening, there's no changing if they're not aware of a problem. And so when problems, so at a place like a university counseling center, for example, um, they are a sample of the university, but they're only the sample of people who were willing to seek help on campus. And that sample may not be representative of the general university population. Um, and so we have to consider what a university sees in terms of data input and how they respond to that data. Um, all of that simply to say that regardless of how a university or uh, institution uh, responds, um, they do have an obligation to respond. Um, most universities have uh, campus wellness centers. Uh, they have um, uh, university counseling centers. Um, some very, uh, some are very, very large. Um, and so we do know that universities have systems in place to address things like student mental health. Um, but students are, uh, 
universities are also obligated to respond specifically to COVID. It, in my opinion, they respond expected to respond specifically to that. A lot of the stressors in, in, in college students' lives are the direct result of being in that institution. And so that institution has an obligation um, uh, to provide resources that are high quality enough to prevent um, mental health resources, uh, mental health concerns when used uh, by the student population. So I have four primary recommendations that I would give to um, uh, universities uh, as a whole. Now, when I say universities as a whole here, I guess I mean more explicitly traditional on-ground universities. Um, when we talk about working in an online environment, um, obviously we don't have the on-ground infrastructure and so that ends up working a little differently. Uh, but at the same time, <clears throat> at the same time, um, the spirit of these sort of recommendations could still be applied uh, even in university settings, which are not physical. Um, and so uh, first and foremost, um, because we know that our, uh, the vulnerable populations uh, in our, uh, uh, among our students are more strongly impacted, we need to ensure access to mental health care uh, to all students. Um, a university college uh, uh, counseling center is fantastic. Um, but if that university college counseling center is open and sees clients from nine to 4.30, that's not gonna work for non-traditional age students most of the time. That non-traditional age student is not going to be able to physically be there for counseling. Um, and they also may be someone who is not capable of affording um, uh, treatment outside of uh, that university college uh, setting. And one of the really great ways to extend availability to students who have difficulty accessing uh, resources like this is through telehealth. That losing the travel time between having to leave um, work during your lunch hour, come uh, come to campus and somehow sit for 50 minutes for a session and turn around and go back to work all within the span of an hour is somewhat resolved um, through the use of telehealth. Size of institution matters here. Um, I think uh, that where I went to grad school, um, the university had something like 23,000 students um, and very few online programs. Um, and so they were focused on delivering uh, con uh, delivering services physically on ground. Um, and COVID really would have been the first thing that would have made them step back and reevaluate that. It's important that we build out programs and services that are specifically targeted towards vulnerable populations. That if we know and we can see from the data post COVID that vulnerable populations are more specifically impacted um, and have more severe outcomes, then we have to focus on programs that, uh, that are targeting those populations specifically. Um, we also have to embrace programs and services that are focused on wellness and building resilience in the student population rather than simply responding to a problem once it exists. This one is a significant problem, uh, in my opinion, at, at the university level. Um, the university wants to respond to problems, um, uh, but doesn't necessarily want to prevent the problem. This is more of an issue that you know, if you're a counselor, you, you kind of see this, right? Because from a counseling perspective, we are wellness oriented individuals. Um, we are uh, uh, we're trained in that way. We look at prevention as, as effective as treatment. Um, and that's not, despite that being sort of a, a, an axiom of our profession, that's not something that really generalizes to the general population. Um, and so when a university sees that, they see themselves as spending a lot of money on, uh, uh, up front uh, without being able to see the results already. Um, but something like COVID in existence can really shake up an under, the understanding of how um, you know, prevention uh, type programs can um, lead to better outcomes. And finally, it's important that we develop a firm understanding of the shared and divergent needs of traditional and non-traditional uh, students. The really, the really unique thing um, here is that if we, if universities would focus 
or on, on specific services for non-traditional students, then they hit the other points of, um, that I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning here because your non-traditional students, they are your vulnerable populations. People who are non-traditional students are um, uh, students of color, they have families, um, they have jobs already, they're managing lots of other, um, uh, they're already managing lots of other responsibilities. Um, addressing the need, the unique needs of the non-traditional student population would, uh, and especially if you're able to address it from a preventative and wellness oriented standpoint, then you are hitting um, almost all four of these. And if you can include telehealth, then you're hitting all four of them. Um, but it's important to remember who makes up the group of non-traditional versus traditional students. Your traditional, traditional students are generally um, come from higher income families. They tend to come from um, uh, white families. Uh, non-traditional students, are, they don't fit that mold. Um, yes, um, being a first generation college student, um, by definition, isn't non-traditional. Um, but you are more likely to be non-traditional in that case. Um, I can talk about that in just a second. Um, but ultimately, uh, as we understand, then begin to understand how COVID has an impact, has had the impact it's had. Um, and as we begin to understand what that's going to look like moving forward, because we understand now that that's not going away. This is something that's going to remain with us. Um, it's not going to remain with us in the same crisis level, perhaps, that it existed on the front end. Um, but it is something that will remain with us. And we all know as professionals that just because you remove a stressor doesn't mean the, the, the impact of the stressor goes away. Um, and so it's something that will stay with um, anybody who was alive and aware during the time that COVID began. Um, and so it's going to be with us for a long time, even if, even if we could have could make it go away tomorrow, which we will not be able to. Um, so that's, I mean, that, that's what I've got in terms of our understanding of where COVID, what COVID has done, recommendations for how we move forward. I know that you all have your own experiences as uh, college students as well. Um, and you may even work in, uh, in university settings. Um, so um, if you have any thoughts, any questions, feel free to come off mute and, and ask them. Um, and I'll, I'll look at the ones that are in chat and we'll try to answer those too. Um, the first one that um, was asked about first-generation college students. Um, a first-generation college student by definition is not necessarily, um, you may, I was a first-generation college student um, I was also a non-traditional student uh, then only because I didn't start out at the university. I started at a, a community college and I went to a university and I never lived on campus. Those types of things made me non-traditional. But had I come directly from high school, moved, uh, began at a four-year institution, um, lived on campus and did you know, the, the old-fashioned sort of traditional college process, that would have made me a traditional student. That being said, you're more likely to be a non-traditional student if you're a first-generation student, because first-generation students generally have additional hurdles to overcome to enter college in the first place. And that generally makes their college experience look slightly different than the traditional student. Put a comment about teaching resilience and well-being uh, in high school and earlier. I I certainly agree with that. Um, I, I think looking at how um, things are, uh, looking at how this profession of school counseling um, really focuses on uh, training resilience at the high school level, uh, understanding the value of prevent of prevention versus treatment. Um, you know, it, it, because it is true that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That, you know, you, there's, if we can prevent a problem, that's always preferable to treating a problem. Um, yeah, that was my comment. Hi, hi. Brian. I'm taking your invitation to interact with you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. <laughs> um, one thing that 
I think we have to be careful about is not to uh, do what we do with adolescents where we made them feel that it was going to be full of so so much turmoil. So I think we have to be cautious not to give people the expectation that just because we're living such through such a difficult time and a challenge of dealing with a worldwide pandemic that they're necessarily going to have problems with their mental health. Mm -hmm. And one thing I noticed at the university where I work is that now all the problems that were blamed before and other reasons were now being blamed on COVID, mm -hmm. including for the staff, like, oh, it wasn't like this before. And I think people have a short memory because there were always, there were always mental health challenges during this really important developmental time, even if you are a non-traditional student. When you take that time and energy and resource out of your life to devote to your studies, then it's a it's a it's a developmental task, I would say, no matter what your age. But thank you very much for the practical suggestions. I think those were really helpful. You're, uh, you're very welcome, and, and I agree with you. I mean, there's, um, you know, here I don't hear as much of it because we were already an online program before, um, but. Um, you know, I have friends who work in on-ground uh, programs. I have friends who work and still work in student affairs and things like that. And I hear much of the same thing that, you know, COVID is now the new explanation for, for everything. And it, it has had a profound effect, but it is being used as an as explanation for things that were already there. I think if maybe we have people now that are noticing things they didn't notice before. And so they have to acknowledge COVID. As they, they acknowledge COVID as the reason that they see it, but they just didn't see it before. Um, mental health concerns are obviously uh, omnipresent in college students only, but I mean, the university I went to had a, a, a counseling center that was, you know, they had something like 10 psychologists on staff. That's a gigantic counseling center. Uh, and, and so clearly there must be uh, enough mental health issues um, to, to, to warrant um, a counseling center of that size. Um, so it's not new, it's just, yeah. it, it, it has shifted things to a degree that allows people to see it that maybe didn't see it before. Um, we also know that a lot of research, if you go back, especially in the mid, uh, around 2003, 2000, uh, to 2000, probably eight, a lot of research that says, you know, related to college student mental health, that college students don't utilize the resources that are available to them. We don't understand. Why don't they, why don't they go to counseling? Why don't they do blah, blah, blah? Um, and the answer to a lot of that, at least at the time, was, well, because the vast majority of your students are non-traditional. They can't come. They're busy. They're doing other stuff that they got to do. They can't come and, and sit with somebody for an hour and also go to class and also take care of a family and also do all this other stuff. Um, and so um, I think we're beginning to understand that the university, there, there's this weird disconnect between the way, especially like in a student affairs office, and I'll only speak for where I've worked, um, in how they perceived the student population versus the way the student population actually looked. Um, because if you work in admissions, then what you see is all the 18 year olds bringing their transcripts in um, versus if you work in the transfer office, what you see are all the transfer students who um, have families and have uh, jobs and are, are people of color. And so they, they, you know, that you see two different universities depending on what office you go to. Um, and so being able to step back and see it as one larger system I think COVID has really allowed some universities to really do that. Um, now, whether or not they'll do anything with it is a completely separate problem, but one can hope. Well, one of the things I've been involved with at two universities where I worked in counseling services was instead of just having a traditional model of counseling, maybe six sessions, that kind of thing, we had a single session model where um, you came for 90 minutes it was quite a long mm -hmm. single session and you did uh, some extensive forms before you came in about what you wanted to get out of it. And then we would do a follow up because that met the needs of maybe half of the people that wanted to come in didn't really want to come in for long term counseling. They wanted to right. some more solution focused kind of work and immediate help. So, I mean, that was really effective, I thought. 
But I do think that the COVID has led lent a, a depressive cloud over people because they're having to think about very painful things. They, they know people that have had it. They've had losses. There are more losses in the um, minority populations. I mean, it's just been a reflection of the ills of society, hasn't it, in terms of those who are vulnerable or more vulnerable to this. And it, it's uh, pointed out the inequities. And it pointed out how when everyone was locked down, the climate got better. The, you know, I mean, the environment got better. And the, the message is we, we've not learned that well as we're going back to normal in my view. But I do think it has lent a seriousness to younger people that they didn't necessarily have to reflect on as much. You didn't get the daily death toll in the paper, kind of, you know, in the news. So, but anyway, thanks again. For sure, yeah. And those types of things certainly have an effect. And when we look at the way that programs are designed, they're often designed to be more out of reach of those vulnerable populations to begin with. I mean, that's probably, in, in most cases, and I will say as a, somebody who worked in student affairs, <clears throat> at least from the perspective of us, that was never an intention. It came from, it came from a point of ignorance, uh, an assumption that the population looked a certain way in the sense that they were traditional aged college students, the 18 to 24 year olds um, and didn't acknowledge that not everybody had that same level of privilege. And so therefore um, those systems did not work for the people who needed them the most. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions before we wrap up? All right, well, I certainly appreciate all of you being here. Um, I think we will uh, make uh, presentations, PowerPoint presentations available. Um, if that's not something that you get automatically, um, please email me. Um, I'll put my email in chat and I will send you my presentation if you want. Um, and uh, uh, if you have an interest in this area, also email me. I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, but um, uh, recording should be available at some point, would be my guess. Colleen would know for sure when that was going to be. Um, so, uh, but I do, I do certainly appreciate all of you being here and thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day. Bye, thank you so much.